to Never. mom there with uh, with her son, she's a, with, who's a 13 year old boy with cerebral palsy, and they're there all day. You know, like just the best people. friends of mine who've had AIDS for 30 years. Um, some women, some kids. You know, we just had a really good a cycling friend that joined us. <laughs> How long were you for, there? Back? Only for a few hours. <clears throat> like they, yeah. they, because I, I'm a militant coward. You know, when it comes to getting a, <laughs> you know, when it comes to getting a, <laughs> you don't want to spend a lot of time with, yeah, with like, my good friend Tyrone. Yeah, uh, no, no, uh, no, no, for I, three weeks. I, uh, huh? I just, because if you went inside the hearing room, that was the balls. <laughs> right. my French. Right. But that was right. the people that were knowing they were going to spend the night. Yeah, I got you. And so I was on the outside. But yelling at, at Graham. I mean, you know, all those, oh, yeah. all those uh, bastards. Uh, oh. And they're saying, well, what are you talking about? Uh, this is, this, the numbers add up. And we're saying, well, the Congressional Budget Office, their numbers actually say that you're increasing taxes for everybody. So what are you doing? And, and he said, oh, well, you're being rude. And I said, no, we're not being rude. We're asking you about numbers. And then he gets the cops to get rid of us. Well, the, and the that's when we all lay down the in the The best image was the guy, uh, one of the senators, I forgot yeah. who it was, Shows the document. I got this Damn about. I, I I got this. Uh, I got this a couple of hours ago. We're going to vote on it now. You know, Bastards. it's it's unbelievable. But I mean, they're railroading this, and it just continually goes on. That's the real question. Why is it happening like this? I mean, I admire the fact that you go down there to. I've gone know, down to, twice. Yeah, Other yeah, people yeah, but, have gone but, down four or five but, times. Yeah. I mean, I got beat up at the inauguration. And I've never been so happy to be around cops pulling me away from the Trump supporters, you know? Uh -huh. And it, it takes right. a lot for me to be right. rather with the cops. Right. But they, I think that there are incredible people pushing pushing back. Yeah. And Heather didn't go to jail, huh? I, no, I saw you Heather saw and chatted that. with Heather and <laughs> she looks like she fit right in. Heather was looking great right out there, <laughs> you know? And, and Bernie walked through and everybody high-fived Bernie. Bernie welcomed us, so. And he said he's working really closely between Bernie and Chuck. They're working closely together. Try and do something in the Senate, but I mean, this is a catastrophe. Who was the other one? Schumer. Schumer. That Bernie Sanders is working with Chuck Schumer. <laughs> Chuck. Chucky. Chucky. Look, they're all on a first day Chucky, basis yeah. here. I, yeah. I'm, Chucky, I'm yes. an anarchist. Oh, I can't. <laughs> they're all, I can't deal with these people. It's like I'm not getting arrested in front of the elevators, you bastards. You guys are all Nazis. I mean, I, don't, I can't. My patience is very limited with how long I can hit. And all, they're all preppy bastards. They're all dressed like they're going to go to the country club before they're going to send you to the gulag, you know? But anyway. Was, <laughs> they went to Dacos before they yeah, sent yeah, you yeah. to the gulag. Lord have mercy. Yeah, that's another kind of country club. Oh, God. To the <laughs> but really, the thing is, is I get inspired by how many good people there are that are in the opposition that are, are trying to yeah. be thoughtful. And Think committed. Asking, Chris, Chris, Chris is, is very great. <laughs> She put up the best comment on Facebook. Yeah, move my job. I do, yeah, whenever, we, get it, go, whenever we get it going, whenever we... Hey, Stanley, can I ask, can I ask a question about the lecture? Will you take that, Page Let him get finished. Let him finish the conversation? Okay. How are you, the Chris? problem is, is what is the bet here that they're going to somehow you. take some of these people out in the midterm? Is that the strategy? What was Chris's comment on Facebook first? Oh, Chris's comment was great <laughs> about what, why, is it, why aren't there people right taking why up arms? Why aren't they throwing rocks and rioting in the street? <laughs> people <laughs> are out. Good comment. Yeah, this morning. Yeah, maybe my morning. Yeah, taking up arms. Yeah. Yeah, why aren't people taking up arms? Taking up arms. I don't think it would do anything. Because they believe in uh, nonviolent resistance. They really do. Well, what are examples of violent resistance that work? I mean, the Irish Revolution. I mean, the American Revolution. That kind of did that. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say in the 20th century when did violent revolution. So you have to frame resistance. this as the new taxpayer revolt, huh? I mean,. I, don't I, think know. I'm not. I think they are. They already are. been it. framed that way. No, right. I think they are rushing it because a lot of them won't get elected because of it. You know, they're gonna they're gonna lose their. They're office. gonna get the inheritance tax so they can give their kids the so money. So let's get it in before yeah. we. Oh, I see. That's what you're saying. I see. Before I see. the midterm election. You think that's before. what's really? Yeah. Early. Okay. I I th I'm just wondering what the Democrat strategy is to, yeah. They think they're going to win in the in the uh, in the midterms, right? They, they have their gonna, own donors. 
Yeah, they have their own donors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, because this is basically a, a, you know, there was no fight really over, you know, in a sense. Right? I mean, there just was a vote. Right. The, uh, the, the uh, yeah. Democrats countered with the problem that it would cause a deficit. Yeah, so stupid. Not that, yeah. that yeah. No. it was class war. No, that, exactly. that was uh, an example of close reading. <laughs> yeah. <It> was. <laughs> You say you really care about the deficit. What is this about? <laughs> that was a smart move. I mean, they 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 know that there's no um, room in American politics for anything else but finance. Everything else is basically uh, mumbles. And so they're, they're deconstructing the Republican imminent fault of advocating um, debt relief with the tax center bill. And I think that's a smart idea. If the Democrats, the, the great thing about the Democrats and the one reason for supporting them under any circumstances is you know one thing for sure, they won't do anything. <laughs> and I'm for that. They are an imitation state organization. They have a major ideological function, however. They keep the left completely undressed. Yeah, completely neutralized. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, completely. Yeah. And it's been going on 45, it's been since the, the 68 uh, convention. Oh, earlier. earlier than that, but at least 68 there was some uprising, you know, at the convention. 72 was the last gas. The last gas. In the Carbon yeah. campaign. Yeah, yeah. Which they didn't even put their muscle behind. Well, more people were arrested in 2004 than any convention in U.S. history. So yes, that was a big, that was a bit of a, that was right here. A lot of people say that's a glass gasp. We were on the streets. People were in jail. Tons of people well, were in no, jail in 2004. Yeah, the the uh, Bush re-election. Yeah. In 2004 in the Bush re-election? What are you talking about? There are more people arrested in that convention than any convention yeah. in U.S. Okay, history. The Republican convention. Yeah. It was here in We New were York. swept off the streets yeah. going more to work. people got arrested? In yeah. that in than, that than in, any in other 68. Time. Than in 68. Or even more than 68. Yeah. yeah. Floors are cold. There. Yeah, but 68 had something that went along too. It had an internal movement too. You had the congressmen, you know, yelling and arguing and still, you know, yeah. And you had, you know, a, a very different discourse alongside the arrests, I, I think. Yeah. At least. You know, it was a very different climate, obviously. But, yeah. I mean, the right has controlled the discourse. I mean, since Reagan, this is basically the continuation of Reaganism, you know, by the same old means. <laughs> Same Based thing. on what you've read in these lectures, <coughs> what single sentence summarizes Adorno's direction? Based on what we're reading now? Yeah. Well, he's moving from the idealism, uh, the idealistic uh, dialectics of Hegel and he, it looks like he's going to move to the materialist dialectic of Marx. 1923, 1924, this is 58. You know, there's something else going on. Uh, that's going on all the time, but he's relying on Hegel because he thinks Hegel's got a lot to offer. But that's not what, what I think is going on. Try this one. Science is the discourse of rule. The rule is simple causality. Is what? Simple causality. People die of cancer. Simple causality. Um, the progressives. Uh, agree on this. The conservatives agree on that. Um, what he's talking about over and over and over again, whether he's talking about part and whole, causality, um, 
or almost anything else, he's talking about how what Makuza said was the case that we are witnessing the moralization of America, but witnessing the moralization of civilization and science is leading that moralization. Yeah. And, and until you, unless and, 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 and until you address the problems of scientific logic, we're not going to address the problems of <coughs> capitalism, we're not going to address the problems of <coughs> social change. And hardly anybody does it. <coughs> the only two major scientists who actually had addressed it were Levins and Lewontin, and particularly in their book, The Dialectic of Biologists. And they have another book about biology, which I haven't read, but it's supposed to be books a, a book of their essays together on this issue. Not in our genes, I think. No. No, that's another that's one. Another book. Okay. No. okay. Oh yeah, a book on science, yeah, I know. But I know another the book one. on science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> the title of that. yeah. Dick was standing Dick Dick Levins was standing in the um, in the elevator in the graduate school and turned to me and he said, Stan, he said, what's going on with these people? Why isn't anybody talking about science except us? He, met, he included me because I had written several books and also many articles on the subject. I said, because the left is stupid, which I think is true. St stupid doesn't mean that there aren't intelligent people or radical people and people with you know, a good position on various issues, they don't know what is going on. What's going on is the domination of science. That is capital's biggest weapon. Simple causality. Cancer causes death. Heart failure, cancer, and then a bunch of little things cause death. That's exactly what science teaches. Don't examine the largest social and economic, or he would call it social, the largest social context within which disease and events take place. Find a simple formula for, of explanation. That's what we do. That's, and it's in these chapters that we were reading. If you read them already, Chapter 10, Chapter 9, Chapter 11. And he wouldn't care, I mean, and this is Adorno, the way he, and he said it in one place, but he didn't say it this way. He wouldn't care whether 99% of all scientists in the world, or 99.9% .9 of all scientists in the world, accept a simple causality. He's not going to give you that. He's going to talk about the dialectic, what Michael just talked about as the discourse of, uh, of communication. It's very important. Believe it or not, I've discovered in the course of this class that many very, very good people are befuddled by the dialectic. I think it's very important. Beth doesn't attend all the time. She can't do it, she says. She's having terrible trouble. Terrible trouble with the breathing. Yeah, I don't think it's a difficult look at all. No, it was more so with some of the previous reading, I guess, um, with Lefebvre, I think she had trouble with So did I. Who? Lefebvre. With Lefebvre, yeah. That? Lefebvre. 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 Yeah. That's a straightforward, in my view, that's a straightforward book. Yeah. That was harder than Adorno. That? I thought that was easier than Adorno. 
Now, <laughs> I, I go in and out with the doorknob. It's actually much simpler than the doorknob. I can make sense of that more. This is harder. Much harder. I mean, I, the, I, the, I, the, I assigned the Fed because I thought it was a good starting point for much to address the problem of the dialectic. The first yeah. hundred pages of Lefebvre were not that hard, but afterward it got difficult. Because of? Uh, hmm? Because of? What would be the difficulty? I don't know, after about yeah. 110, page 110 what? or whatever. But I after the exposition of Hegel's dialectic and yeah. dialectical contradiction, then something else happened that made yeah. it difficult. But what was that? What it's was that? It's hard to remember. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. If, you want, <laughs> if you want a very cogent elaboration of Adorno's own point of view on the dialectic, um, but compressed, part three of his, his, his one of his against books. Against, against epistemology. Against epistemology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a great. Uh, that's a great uh, starting point for that. Yeah. It's a very. It's yeah, a very, very compressed section the, of, a, of a longer book. And a very important uh, part of his corpus. It actually begins sort of with with what he speaks about in, in the lecture uh, that we went over last week and, and also in, uh, in, in lecture eight, that uh, dialectics never really begins with first principles. And there argument, is no yeah, beginning. Yeah, no beginning. Yeah. beginning. Yeah, yeah. No beginning. Or principles. You know, it's not a metaphysics either. You know, so this is, you know. He has hidden in there the concept that difference is not opposition. But opposition is not dialectic by itself. And that dialectics is about, in the first instance, movement. If there's any first instance, he doesn't mean right, principle. Right. The movement of history is probably, for him, and also for Horkheimer, although not for Marcuse, the movement of history is the guiding thread to enable us to understand, to grasp human beings and their social Activity, actions, activities. I'm going to start with the with the quote that suggests to me from Michael a good quote. Page eighty-eight. <coughs> Yeah, the Benjamin fight. In order to show you how these things unfold with regard to the actual work of cognition, I could perhaps say something here about a controversy in which I was engaged over 20 years ago no. Well, he's talking about in the thirties. I am referring I'm, 20 years ago now with Walter Benjamin when he was writing his work on Baudelaire. I am, by the way, the work on Baudelaire, I'm going to do some commentary, just commentary. The work on Baudelaire is actually captured in a separate volume from the collected, uh, selected essays, which is published later on. It's on Baudelaire. 
and you should be able to, I don't know whether you can still find it. Do you know it's what? available. It's Did Charles you? Baudelaire, Lyric Poets, and the Age of High Capitalism. Yeah. That's, that's the title that was Baudelaire. published from the un, unpublished manuscript while Benjamin was alive. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now unpublished. you must understand yeah. that with this 1937-38 controversy with, with Benjamin, it is also true that for Adorno, and I'm going to be scientific here for the moment, Benjamin will see the cat's piss. <laughs> he was highly ad ad admiring of Benjamin, but in this case he was disapproving of many of his ideas, which were articulated in the Baudelaire book namely ideas which he considered to be ultimately anarchist. And I can't disagree with Adorno on the one hand, and on the other hand, the, ins the collected insights are... Uh, um, invaluable. Can we, Stanley, before, what happened as a result of this? Can we just ask, can I just, am I asking, to go over the controversy, the people have different views of what, whether he helps block Benjamin from getting a university job at this point. I'm just wondering, because Benjamin eventually killed himself, you know, yeah, in sort of exile. There's two versions now out about Benjamin's 1940. Yeah. A, he killed himself, or B, he was killed. Ate the pill? He was murdered, yeah. Those are the two versions. The second version, I have no uh, knowledge of, of empirical proof. Does anybody know is that, what, what it's there's based There's no on? empirical proof at this stage. I mean, yeah. there's, there's speculation about it, but the, the, the dominant story, as you know, is, has been that he took enough, um, you know, opium right. to kill Sorry. four yeah. horses. You know, and the story of what you mean is that. Uh, big time. Yeah. 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 His first, his first book, which was his dissertation, was turned down by a German university that he attended. That would have been, made him Dr. Benjamin, and he would have qualified him to teach college. It's probably a good idea that he didn't get the... Um, right, he never would have done the Arcades <laughs> Project, <laughs> right. hung out with Brecht. Uh, yeah. A lot of these things wouldn't have happened. I don't know about hanging out with, <laughs> hanging out with Brecht. But right. You know, Universities right. impose requirements on their faculty, and uh, very few of them transcend the conditions of, of labor that they are required to uh, endure. Not just classes, although not to underestimate. How many teachers? How many kids do you teach? Um, Thirty. Thirty-five. Yeah, all together. Well, no. Well, ter per class, and how many twenty-one hours. Do you teach? Twenty-one hours a semester, a year. So four and three. Four, four and three. So he's teaching 140 every semester. And doing labor, chapter chair. So I'm yeah, doing, chapter yeah, chair. Doing, doing, doing and going to jail. So doing you took over from Bob? Yeah. <laughs> well, I got strong-armed into it. Taking over is, is <clears throat> you <got> generous <laughs> word for it. I'm about to let them all know they can piss off, because academic laborers are the biggest whiners on the planet. I think this YouTube the biggest, be a good No, 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 no. I'm I go on the record and say that. I work with people no, okay. with AIDS, people with AIDS in homeless, in homeless right. population that they didn't complain like academics. Right. Go get right. a real job. Go to the right. Bronx every day for 12 hours. Right. You're See, whining about teaching one class. And he right. is in an, an alleged senior college. <laughs> What's this, Lehman? No, City Tech. Or, or 13th grade. As it's, we it's a community college with some add-ons. Costas, Costas is no longer uh, involved. The Hostess is part of the PSA. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, they're, they're yeah, CUNY. Sure. Costas. Yeah, you have some, some yeah. Hostess students. Where, 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 why did Costas do? Costas didn't do... Costas? Costas didn't do anything. You Costas. Yeah, that's another story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just wanted to mention something about this whole thing with Adorno okay. not getting a Benjamin a, a job. Yeah. Um, part of the problem is is that it wasn't that Adorno was you know against or held him up or stand yeah. still. He was a bit remiss in terms of making the connections to the Warburg Institute in London, 
where they thought they could have get Benjamin a, a, a position, you know, right. going back to Abby Warburg. There was this Warburg Institute, you know, that was created in the 30s, right, as a place for scholars to go, mm -hmm. and, you know, famous library in, in Bloomsbury um, in, in, in London. He was a freelancer so, yeah, all of his adult life. Yeah, his whole time was freelancer. And so, Ben. So Adorno didn't do the right, didn't give him the right reference. Didn't didn't was a bit remiss, a bit slow oh, to get wow. the kept the project. It wasn't like a direct thing. It just was slow on it. You know, th this is really the official, more official okay. story than he just outright, you know, you know, st stalemated or you know, yeah. stalled the uh, uh, okay. uh, Benjamin. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Didn't do enough, in other words. Okay. That's probably Benjamin died at forty-eight. Yeah. 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 And yeah. you know. To be a um, freelancer, I know people who are freelancers at that age, it's not easy. To, yeah. It's not easy to get jobs, to yeah. get assignments. Yeah. So, yeah. It's like adjunct jobs, yeah. and they're not easy either anymore. Yeah. yeah. And Adorno was actually 11 years junior, Benjamin, too. Benjamin, 1892, oh, really? yes. and Adorno, 1903. And wow. died in 1969. He died of uh, embarrassment. <laughs> I don't know. That's very well put, Stanley. <laughs> of what? Embarrassment. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> say more. Yeah, I want to say more about that. Well, you know, he was a uh, he was a um, a guru to tons of students at at um, Frankfurt. Um, many of the famous students who became writers and activists, um, artists. So the most famous Klu being Angela Davis here. Angela Davis here, but yeah, yeah, Alexander yeah. Kluger, Kluger. Yeah. Um, Oscar Neck. Right. They wrote a very important book on what was called the proletarian public sphere. Um, and others, and, and it was clear that he did not like the New Left. He did not like the demonstrations and the embarrassments that the New Left visited upon uh, people in power. He thought it was unsophisticated and uh, attacked it. And they finally came, came out after him by uh, becoming nude in front of him and uh, waving bloomers at him and brassiers and all that kind of stuff and making fun of him. And I don't think he could, to he could tolerate it. Wow. <clears throat> Stanley, I read a great um, citation of what uh, Adorno said to, I think, Marcuse about 68 in the letter. He said, I don't understand why people are pro building barricades against the people who hold the bomb. So you didn't think you were serious, right? Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do with the barricades against the purveyors of atomic weapons? <laughs> yeah. Well, we're, we're not going to bomb. Right. That's what they knew. Right. They, they left the country first. De Gaulle left the country in 68. He went into exile rather than... He ran away. Yeah, he ran away, yeah. Exile is not that different. <coughs> Marcusa had a concern that the Frankfurt School were corrupting him, and Adorno's reply to that, that's through his wife, was saying that, that the Frankfurt uh, yeah. School was corrupting him. And Marcusa and Adorno replied, Adorno? Yeah, no, corrupting Marcusa. Uh -huh. And so Adorno's reply is, is that at least they're beginning to notice it. <laughs> <laughs> I am referring to the unpublished opening part of this work and specifically to the interpretation of one of the poems from Baudelaire's cycle, La, Le Vin, Le Vin des Chiffoniers, the ragpicker's line. At the time when I, when Baudelaire was writing the ragpicker's line, was writing the rag pickers were seen as extreme representatives of the Lumpen proletariat and thus 
possessed key significance for the de depiction of penury, which plays such an important role in French literature as a whole in this period. You have only to think of Les Miserables in this connection. In his interpretation of this poem, Benjamin had discussed a wine tax which was levied in Paris at the time and which forced the workers to go out beyond the town gates, outside the banure. Do you know what the banure are, everybody? Okay. The, sub the, the suburbs. suburbs. But, the, but the French suburbs, the Paris suburbs, are not like the New York suburbs, except for Mount Vernon and New Rochelle, which are pretty proletarian. They are uh, proletarian spheres where people are forced out of the city to, to, to live, not in hovels, but live in uh, uh, crowded circumstances. I, And there were some contemporary French writers who claimed, although this does not sound particularly credible, that these subsequently intoxicated workers defiantly displayed their drunkenness when they came back into the city precisely to demonstrate in the spirit of an oppositional act, that they had managed to do something otherwise beyond their means, namely to get thoroughly drunk. And Benjamin believed that he could specifically discover certain motifs of this kind in the cycle Levin. I would like to leave aside the question whether that is actually true or not. In looking through this material again recently in connection with these lectures, the details of Benjamin's argument struck me as rather more plausible now than at the time when we were involved in the original controversy. Anyway, the drift of his argument was to, ta to take the question of the materialist determination of reality as a whole, which according to him, to his theory, possessed a key role in Baudelaire's poetry as well, and trace it back immediately to, spe to specific events and experiences such as the wine business concerning, concerned, excuse me, cheap drinking establishments and the rank merchants and so forth. Now I do not wish, of course, to demote the significance of such individual experience in this connection. But if you consider the idea of a material dialectic here, that is, of a theoretical explanation of social facts on the basis of specific material conditions, then it is obviously not enough for a theory of this kind to appeal to such unmediated data about the wine business or the suburbs. However concrete that may appear, however tempting such a concreteness may be, and however exciting and stimulating the thought of connecting such a apparently vivid and concrete data immediately with the highest speculative categories. But this is the same tendency, the same temptation of dialectical thought which Hegel perceived in the work of Shelley and the task of protecting thought from his words, certainly not, at le not the least of those which Hegel undertook to fulfill in his polemic with Schelling. In this regard, Benjamin was more of a Schellingian, Schellingian I guess, than a Hegelian. I'm att I attempted at the time to suggest to him that it was not enough 
where the dialectical interpretation of poetic content is concerned to identify individual motifs of material contradictions and the material tensions of the kind we are talking about. Rather, the materialist dialectic must constantly and under all circumstances act, acknowledge that the individual findings on which it is based and determined by the whole that they are mediated by the to to totality of society. Thus, it is, it is that the individual experience by the totality of society. Thus, it is that the individual experiences, however startling and however tangible they may be, never suffice in themselves if we wish to draw social work, social conclusions of a theoretical kind, conclusions which concern the theory of society itself for the individual moments are experienced much for their part, must for their part be related to the structure of the social totality. If we do not wish to resign ourselves to the mere description of particular vivid data, and, we're, and where we are interested in the relationship between Baudelaire's lyric poetry and the age of high capitalist capitalism, and this is indeed the first and still unparalleled case of a poetry which is wrested from speci specific conditions of high capitalism. We cannot merely content ourselves with seizing on individual features of capitalism, capitalist reality, as though as these appeared before the eyes of Baudelaire and inducing them in order to explain the content of his work. Rather, we must try, in, th in this connection, to derive the common commodity character, which does indeed play a quite central role in Baudelaire from the structure of social, of society as a whole, and then attempt to proceed the subjective reflection of the commodity form in this poetry itself, rather than contenting ourselves with individual motivations here. Now, what is going on? If you look at CBS, uh, uh, PBS Evening News and Amy Goodman, what we have is a recitation of particulars over and over and over and over again, as if in each case there is some one, not something, to blame. I have never, maybe you have, can correct me, I'd be happy to accede to your observation, detected in Amy Goodman's Democracy Now! a complex um, analysis which amounts to a, cause, a series of causal connections to the phenomena that she presents. Have you? She's where the left is now, by the way, in my opinion. Purely descriptive. And in, in, although the description of brutality and of poverty <coughs> exceed those presentations of PBS News, they do not improve on CBS News in depth. And she, pres and she is uh, celebrated as the um, news broad broad broadcast at the left.
I don't think you're going to get an argument in this room. I don't think so either. Yeah. Although, I mean, what, what you're pointing out, at least vis a vis Adorno, is that Amy Goodman becomes a, a, a manifestation or a symptom of leftist positivism, which is part of the dialectic, but it's still positivistic. Yeah, that's what I want to it's not, yeah, yeah. Anyway. The next point, obviously, yeah. if everybody is um, <laughs> on board with, with Adorno's analysis, which I simply elaborated on a little bit. The next point is that relationship between the, the particular and the general, or the, the whole, or he calls the whole, and the, and the particular. The reason he uses the term whole, I suspect, is because he's distancing himself from his own teacher, Lukács, who uses the term totality. Well, no, no. when you use the word the whole, that could be um, misinterpreted as a conglomeration of different <coughs> factors. Although he tells you what he means. What he means is the totality. And, and for um, Marx and Lukács, the totality consists in the subject-object dialectic. It's, uh, it's the rumption, which means it's split, is when the subject and object are so separated that a, uh, that a that never mind about an integration, but that a, 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 a conversation between them is not possible anymore. The Democrats in Congress are saying, we used to talk together, we used to sell out together. Now you're not even allowing us to sell out together. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Right. And when Collins got a few, uh, a few concessions, she immediately uh, agreed to vote for the bill, and people who might have been sympathetic to uh, Collins might conclude that the bill was the best they could get under those circumstances. She could have voted no. And she she would have sunk no. it. She would have sunk it. No, the Republican and Party would have she didn't from want Alaska, to How did she vote? Murkowski yeah. voted for it. She voted for it. Yeah. Oh, and, and so did uh, McCain. McCain, yeah. No, yeah. I knew McCain. Take cancer away from people in Medicaid. Medicaid. Take cancer treatment away. So, but when, so the critique, I mean, I haven't read what, it's hard because I haven't read what Benjamin wrote about Baudelaire, but it sounds like he's, I mean, when he says, it sounds like it's not being sufficiently critical of individual experiences in connection to the materialist dialectic. He's sort of saying he's describing the poetry versus being dialectical, an interpretation of the poetry. Mm -hmm. mm. Theoretical. Okay. If you look at uh, page 281, just to you know, yeah. amplify yeah, yeah, yeah. a little bit, I saw the, footnote, the long yeah. footnote is uh, very good because yeah. Adorno's actual writing. Oh, yeah, I saw that, yeah. Right? Unless I'm very mistaken, your dialectic is lacking in one thing mediation. Yeah. <laughs> so the most fundamental aspect of the Hegelian dialectic. And, and the point is that all individual experience. Is mediated by social relations. Yes. Right. Yeah. And he, and, he, and he does that several times in his lectures. Obviously, because he believes there is some level, even in an audience of some sophistication, still, still holds to the uniqueness of individual experience. I mean, you do get an idea if you read this passage, you know, carefully and slowly, of the deep care that Adorno has for thought and for his friend Benjamin at the same time. Yeah, it's not a dis it's not disrespectful and it's not mm -hmm. really in a way. I mean, he's really trying to show him, you know, where the tendencies are in the uh, yeah. in the uh, in the uh, 
the, 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 the text, right? And yeah. And he says at the end, again, the materialistic determination of cultural traits is only possible if it is mediated through the total, back to the totality, social process. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. It's so, it just seems, because he's so complimentary or appreciative of Benjamin's yeah. other work. So he must have really hated this. Or just but really. There, but, there is a di- but there is a difference. Yeah. Does your, your, does your college have a, um, a writer in residence or a poet in residence? You have the scholar on campus thing. Whatever that means. I carry books around. <laughs> I got it. I had, to give, I had to give a lecture once. I don't know. I mean, that's kind of all we got. I mean, we're being very Benjamin in here, not a door. Scholar gave one lecture. Scholar gave one additional lecture, and then I had to give some, bring some other people in to give some lectures. And also taught courses. Yeah, and taught courses. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's just so interesting. Benj- if, if Dorno is ten years younger than Benjamin. You know, how did, what did he, he go straight into, he was on the street, he was on, yeah, so he's on the straight track to, to a professor, like, what, out of high school? And then Benjamin's freelancing and running around Paris? What was Adorno doing? He just was... Adorno was in the Institute. He was in the Institute. Yeah, the Institute was subsidized. Subsidized. One by a rich guy. Yeah. And then by Columbia University, in part, which gave them rooms and television right. rooms, okay. which is right. not to be underestimated as right. important. But I'm just saying, how did Benjamin get on the track into the Institute, and Benjamin was sort of hovering on the outside He was never of really a member, to the best of my knowledge, right? He was never really a member. It's always peripheral to the Institute. I don't know where Benjamin yeah, was. Also, he was also published by them and yes, supported that's true. by them. Yeah, yeah okay. Because he wrote stuff, yeah, yeah, and was published. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I actually don't think any book by him was published in his lifetime. Benjamin, yeah, yeah, lots I of lots of articles. I think a lot of what he wrote was published in um, magazines. Yeah, right. Yeah. So the first collection, for example, Illuminations, were a collection of his fifties of essays. Yeah, yeah, and put together by Anna Arendt. Who like he taught in the like he taught in the, in, in the French <laughs> Communist Party's school. Yeah, he may have lived in the, not right, right, for a while. Right. I mean, he, and he was a member of the Collège de Sociologie, right, right, right yeah. in, uh, yeah. in France. Yeah, yeah. Nobody thought of Benjamin as a Communist Party hack, even if he taught in that school. Yeah. No. Okay. Was he a member of the Communist Party, the German Communist Party? Then I don't think he was a member of any party. <clears throat> but he was sympathetic to the Communist parties. He was also sympathetic to the Surrealists. What? He was also sympathetic to the Surrealists. Very much so. Yeah. So. And to those kicked out of the Surrealist movement. Yeah. George Bataille in particular. Bataille stuff is coming out slowly. Great. Great. There's a collection of his essays. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a three volume book called The Accursed Share. I think there's now something else. Okay. He was, Bataille was a Communist Party sympathizer who did nothing else but not, this is not literally true, but did never ceased criticizing the Communist Party. As a member of the party. But how did he not get kicked out? Did he get kicked out? I don't think he was a member. No, he was never. I don't remember. Not a member of the party. Oh, okay. He got kicked out of the Surrealist movement. Okay, and how did he do that? I didn't even know that could happen. I mean, excuse me, Breton says that there's never been such a vulgar character. 
Nešlo tam. To je velmi jádrné. Of anything, any reasonable so, word could be a bad Is that round to the Is that round to the earth? It took, it, it took the dialectic really to the extreme of the extreme. Is that round to be kicked out? Second, yes, and Marteau too. Antoine Marteau. Kicked out? Yes, those were the two most famous people kicked out by Chairman uh, I'm sure Breton. there wasn't a floor vote against yes. them. I didn't Chairman even know they had Breton. meetings. Chairman Breton, who was known as Stalin, and, and but I was Jesus. known as Trotsky in the movement for the. Breton kicked out as many, lots of people. Well, lots of people. Those are the two most famous oh. that I know. Of. Oh, yeah, no, you're always people. kicking out people. Yeah, yeah. You love to do that. You're fired. You're but, fired. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fired. Yeah. But do you have a floor vote to do that? How do you actually kick somebody out of the Syria? I mean, you know, like, it's a dream. Movement. I don't even believe, believe you are really voting. He I mean. wrote the manifesto. He <laughs> wrote the manifesto. They had ground the rules like that. Is man, the situation is yeah. Yeah. They kicked, kicked out almost out everybody out. Out too, yeah. But one. <laughs> <laughs> Guy Debord? He survived? Yeah. Debord, no. He got kicked out? I'm not sure. Yeah. Lord have mercy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> And then his wife left him for Lacan. Bataille's wife. Bataille. Yeah, going back to Bataille. Yeah. Well, so the wine tax. He's saying he didn't analyze the wine tax enough. Wasn't wasn't. Uh, well, he didn't presuppose the social totality. He they didn't mediate the on the okay. Yeah, every individual, wow. you know, okay. experiences. Too much, and he drew too much out of that, right? Yeah. Which for Adorno was ultimately not a materialistic dialectic as he would see it, right? Okay. It's, it remained idealistic. Well, do you yeah. have questions? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think if he's yeah, saying this, yeah. uh, that yeah, it's yeah. not supposed to be mechanical, that's this whole thing is all like the previous lecture is all that this is not What's supposed to be mechanical. The the dialectical interpretation can't because if it's mechanical, it's reductive, and that's yeah. missing the point. Mm -hmm. And yet, this is, I think, a mechanical interpretation of. Poetry of his interpretation of poetry. I think it's heavy handed. I mean, that's my sense. You sin. mean, is Adorno mechanical? I think, uh, I think that Adorno, for somebody who's saying the dialectic is not supposed to be mechanical, it's supposed to be open to contradictions and well, much more well, complex. He doesn't fluid. accuse uh, culture, uh, men you mean of a art. mechanical. I think it uh, sounds like he is being mechanical. By social relations. Yeah. What? Which I've taken more or less for granted, in my opinion, which means you're right. I, I think you're right. Um, his readings of philosophy and social theory and music are more fluid, more contradictory, more interesting than his readings of fiction, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, okay. His. Um, <coughs> His book on, on on the new music is a very very powerful book. Although it's uh, you'll find it controversial for your own taste, I'm sure. The thesis of which is relatively simple, and he says it almost in these terms: in this fucked up world. Music is a prime vehicle for for um, exhibiting dissonance and rejection of the predominant uh, politics and social relations. In music, that takes the form of rejection of tonality. Any music that hangs on to tonality in the 20th century, he's not even talking about his own time, in the 20th century is uh, not subversive, is not uh, revolutionary music. But Schoenberg, who was not ideologically a revolutionary, in his view, is a revolutionary musician who points to the bankruptcy of tonal music. And his examples of tonality that amount to um, a surrender to the existing bourgeois norm. But would you rather listen to well, Mozart maybe, or Schoenberg? Me? You're, not to, you're talking to me? Yeah, any of us. Schoenberg. 
Willie, you'd rather just put Willie. that on the turntable at home? Okay. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, 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 I'm musically trained. I, 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 don't know, I mean, I think it's garbage. <laughs> Bar talk, horror. <laughs> but it's interesting because Adorno, if he lived to listen, or if he listened to, um, you know, American, uh, like, late Coltrane or, or free jazz or... Yeah. He, never was, he never heard any real jazz right. or something. But if he did, things. that's exactly what late Coltrane or... I, I would mm -hmm. watch this interview with uh, yeah. John Gilmore, the saxophone, solo saxophonist of the Sun Ra Orchestra. Great music. And it's exactly the same argument, that by making bebop more unaccessible, right, by making it more of, a, of an art form, deliberately, more difficult, more dissonant, more virtuosic, you maintain... Autonomy vis a vis the bourgeois right. capitalist. Right. So Adorno's argument was, I mean, very insightful. Absolutely. In Absolutely. I mean, that music conveyed the negative, no doubt. So but who do you want to listen to? There's the negation right there of the negation. I mean, there's all kinds of. Yeah. But who do you want to listen to? It depends Sunra. on your mood. I love Sun Ra. I love Sun Ra, but I also like. How about Alban like, Berg? What? But Have you listened to Alban Berg? They're horrible. I can't stand that stuff. <laughs> and you're supposed to. And you're supposed to like it when you're studying music. No, you say that's a big cog's theory of taste. You know, I mean, I, uh, <laughs> I mean, you're supposed to sound real, cool real and real say you like it, but I think it may be. I mean, I like it. But Beethoven in his time, right? Like, yeah, I started with it. I mean, it was yeah, the first absolutely. Absolutely. Beethoven in his, like, the late string quartet. Start out with, yeah, the late string quartet. It's very revolutionary. Thank you. It rattled the bourgeois, the aristocratic taste. Yeah. You know. Ears become conditioned over time, right? To yeah. Certain musical construction. Yeah. Sure. Oh yeah. And what you know, right of spring was everybody was I don't know throwing stuff and running out the doors. Yeah. And now it just sounds like. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Tamer than I mean, I think I think free jazz aged better than some of the bar talk and Sean. I just, you know, but you know that's Mer it. Bar talk. I know people, my father-in-law, I went to Juilliard, loves Bartok, but I, I think it's an acculturation thing. Like, it's what your ears are used yeah. to listening to. Oh, I know, I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> Give it a shot. Well, well, I, I, I guess we could, we, could, we could put a door note to the test. What is regressive hearing? Right? Because remember, that's one of his more interesting pieces on this. That we, yeah. He thinks, he, yeah. he thinks yeah. Michael, yeah. When, the, when the music, when the ear for music, right. right or even to speech, has been so drummed in right. to, by tonality so that even the most banal music is appreciated and, and loved, then what you have is a commentary on the relationship between the commercial and the commodification of art, which relies on tonality and the moralization phenomenon of which Marcuse speaks. Right, so art only becomes statement in that case. There's nothing subversive That's anymore okay. about the art. But well, wait a minute. It is true <laughs> it is that you, you don't simply expect to turn on a disc of Berg, of Schoenberg, of Weber, uh, of uh, Cecil Taylor and expect to love it the first hearing. It's different kind of sound. It's it's it's. I was okay as a character on Casey's uh, um, play says it's chesses. A structure and one of Casey's play it means chaos. You know chesses. But as you get to listen to it more, you begin to hear it in a more structured way. It doesn't mean it's easier to listen to. It means you're beginning to understand what it's trying to say. See, um, it's because most people think that music is just, it doesn't require thinking. Like, you know, people, a lot of people are grown up to think that, you know, music is just something we hear and everybody gets it. But it doesn't have to be that way. Could music could be just as rigorous to understand as, as philosophy. I think I the mean, later, that's the point. That yeah. the, the later, I think the later, if Miles is great. Love Bitches Brew, I love the late albums. I think they age really well. I just think the, the tonal music that we're talking about is very hard. I don't think it, I think it's very, I mean, my, fa my, my, my father-in-law who went to Juilliard and grew up playing klezmer music in the Catskills, then 
played, then went into rock and roll after leaving Juilliard, said, you know, like that if music has to become an academic exercise to listen to versus something you feel, then it's garbage and it's going to lose the mass. It's going to lose the mass. Not, that is not what I'm saying. But that's but that's what happened with music. You have to have a degree in musicology to appreciate Berg. Otherwise, I mean, will anybody honestly put on Berg at home on the turntable this year? Yeah, okay, Stanley. Stanley. Sure. Stanley. <laughs> sure. Okay, Stanley will. Uh, sure. Okay, I mean, uh, okay. I have to accompany this Stephen Frew leader almost all, you know, for any voice in any given okay. year. Okay. But it's just it's but the, early. It's the same way people, Fair. a lot of people can read a, a, a difficult novel and not really understand yeah. it. I was yeah. thinking it's all, it happens it's in thing. other art forms, but music has the most emotional content. Yeah. So we relate to music more emotionally than to a painting or even a poem. And those are also difficult. Art, painting, plastic arts can be very difficult. Certainly poetry and, and as you bring up novels can be really difficult. If Look at the exception of Kandinsky when yeah. he first came around. Yeah. Or, um, uh, or um, Picasso. And, uh, and, uh, and and many others who work in that in that uh, vein, they were not thought of as genuine artists. Um, they were writing they were writing music that was, uh, in many ways, challenging. Uh, not music, uh, art. Yeah. They were painting in challenging ways. And they were they expected their audience to think. Not simply as in the popularization of music to feel, but feeling and thinking should not be all that separate. And and going back to what, where Stanley began today, I think it's important to, again to see the dialectic as a movement of history. Mm -hmm. And that a Berg and a Schoenberg appear mm -hmm. on the historical stage at a particular moment absolutely in, in, you know and to appreciate it from that level even in today both retrospectively and prospectively would be the would, would be part of the attempt I appreciate just like you know a Miles Davis is not possible in the 1940s he's possible you know 57 and forward right I mean this the, you know it so is again a, a social history, yeah. totality looking at this dialectically you begin to see it I'm not making a case for Burke or Schoenberg I'm yeah, just saying where they're situated and if you will in, yeah. the, in the historical dialectic and you know and, and, yeah. and how do you hear and why is a, a, a system like this really developed what 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 is being broken in terms of the new form right. you know we're, what is the radical imagination to, at work well you, you know, have to work hard yeah. to achieve knowledge and appreciation of non-commodified non-vocational art forms you're going to tend to go the other direction. Right. Uh, uh, simultaneously, I'm reading Michael Connolly's latest uh, detective novel. Yeah. Uh, I'm a fan of Michael Connolly. And if you, th if you look at Michael Connolly structurally, it makes absolutely no sense. He writes in the, he writes in the vernacular but the um, so-called plot is really mostly uh, disappearing before your, before your eyes. And yet he's a very popular um, novelist and considered in, in the genre to be the best there is, or at least among the best. Um, and, and just to go back to Raymond Chandler, uh, who, together with Hammett, we invented the whole genre, you know, after Edgar Allan Poe, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, Colin Doyle, if you none of Raymond Chandler's novels all together. None. Lady in the Lake. Uh, um, the Big Sleep. The big, the big sleep is uh, from the That's, point of view yeah. of coherence is the worst. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying worst; it's the most extreme. Yeah, yeah, but it's beautiful. Some people question the existence of novels today, whether there's a place for the novel, whether it is 
uh, 20th century or a 19th century form. I, you know, there are few practitioners. You might like the detective novel, which I agree with you, but I also like Lucare, who's a kind of yeah. Dickens of our time, yeah. in a way. He still can, can master an old form. Yeah. You know, I think of what, of Eliot when he talks about saying the thing one no longer has to say, mastering the form for those <coughs> things one no longer has to say. You know, can you write a love poem anymore? That's what uh, the love song of Alfred Prufrock was about. You, he's saying, no, you can't. There's no, no more love poems. They're over. <laughs> And yet, it's a great love poem. Yeah, he's well, demonstrating it. He's demonstrating. I don't know if I'd be I'd be happy to get a poem like that. Oh God! Or the Jimmy Rushing singing for you. The women no love, come to no and fro, no speaking of Michelangelo. <laughs> one of the best lines of all time. I mean, oh. And how still. shall I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I, 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 think, I think Thomas Stern's Elliot is a um, a very fine second second rate poet. Very good. But he points out the, the about poetry that it's no longer love poetry can no longer be That's written. True. Well, but Neruda wrote after that. Do you try, that? Try, no. try William Carlos Williams. Yeah. I, oh, I, I, wrote, I published on William Carlos Williams. But you do you did. believe that argument? I'd yeah. love to read what you say. I haven't read it on William Carlos Williams, but sometimes I get uh, the uh, urge to write about Patterson. About who? Patterson. New Jersey. Yeah. Jersey. 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 You should write about that. That's a great poem. I wrote about yeah. his, his, the poem Asphodel, and I called it his autobiographing because I was looking at Derrida. <laughs> uh -huh. Anyway, for those who don't know <laughs> William Carlos Williams, he was a, uh, a, a doctor yes. in a small town of New Jersey called East Weatherford, pretty close to New York City over the bridge and tunnel. But he was a very uh, creative uh, guy who might be described accurately as a materialist. He was, not, he was not political, he was political for a while, he was, he was close to the communists, but basically that's not his poetry. We should read that in this class sometime, it would be fun to do a close reading of Patterson here. And you could judge, you could work with uh, Louis Sudovsky's A. Yeah, yeah, that would be which great. Which is a to kind have. of uh, rewrite of it in some yeah. ways. Williams a, wrote, so yeah, much yeah. depends upon the white chickens. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah, well, they did, they, a lot depends, so much depends, sure. besides sure. The, sure. the red wheelbarrow glazed with white rain. <laughs> Where did you publish uh, on Williams? Modern <laughs> Poetry Studies. How long ago? A long time ago. <laughs> but she remembers it. <laughs> yeah. About 1980. It's not that long ago. ago. <laughs> 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 well, it isn't that long ago. ago. When I was yeah. in graduate school. Yeah, and, and, and what we call now, it's modern criticism, was already in full swing. Yeah. But do you well, still yeah. read poetry? Yeah. Do you still yeah. believe in love poetry, though? Well, Asphodel is kind of a love poem. It's about it, his infidelities. To, to his wife, it's it's a, a poem about a pol it's an apology. I believe that. Yeah, it's less expensive than the divorce. And yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still believe in love poetry. I still think people. We do poetry readings in Lower East Side and outside in the community gardens every year and every year. Just on Sixth Street. Yeah, just all oh, over Lower East Side. I'll, I'll yeah, and uh, and every time everybody brings, brings a few of their own poems, right. and usually right. by the time people are reading, finished reading Jim Carroll or Allen Ginsberg or whatever, people get to their own poems, and they're all poems about getting dumped. And it's incredible to hear people, <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, with Miller or whatever, yeah, we're all yeah, like, yeah. but it's like people getting dumped or whatever. Yeah. They're in love. We're getting, yeah. but a lot of us, the sad. You write a sad poem when you're sad, yeah. you know. So like, 
But I still, people, this is just deep Bird inside on. of every, all of us have had that moment. Bird and on. I think people still need to say it, still need to tell, share those stories. I think it, it's still deep inside of us. We have to, have to get that out. So, however we do it. Um, so, I don't know. I think the poetry, live poetry is still very alive. No. Yeah, I'm still, just I mean, talking about you, know, you know Adorno's famous saying about both. The problem is that in my in my father and my mother's era, yeah, you did not have to be an English major, right, to read poetry, right, right, right. Yeah, I didn't mean so poetry was over. Yeah. I just meant love 18 poetry. Eighteen or nineteen years really? old. Okay. Poetry is alive and well. Oh no, it's not. Poetry isn't dead. It's just love poetry. What about love novels? Probably. Well, they're pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> but what? What? The, I mean, the debate. Fifty seems, Shades of Grey. Wasn't the debate really about the, the form itself? That yeah. the form of the novel had been exhausted. Yeah. You know, there were phrases such as the literature of exhaustion. Yeah. You know, that every everything, and the same thing for poetry. That the form had been, you know. Taken, you know, to its ultimate no, point. No, I don't think no, so. Okay, not, not the form, the form okay. poetry has is not exhausted. The form, yes. I think, not the novel has. Right. You think it has? The yeah. novel is. It's difficult because you have th this. It's you've got cinema that can tell a story, and people, um, you know. <coughs> Well, fair. well, not only that, the, I mean, the actual, the actual experimental aspects to the novel. This went through many, many stages. Yeah. Does one write engagé literature like Sartre called for? Or is there a new novel like Robriet? Well, or is writing... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. Who's now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sartre. Yeah. But, yeah, but it's not a question of them being... I mean, but it, looking at the novel as form, you know, itself. Look you know, at history. And, and that, the yeah, history of exhaustion. poetry goes as far back as... Sappho. The same, but yeah. the novel yeah. doesn't right. go back that far. No, the novel is a, is an invention of uh, bourgeoisie. It's an 18th century invention. Oh, okay. it's, it's, it's the bourgeoisie. It's yeah. the Cervantes. Of the bourgeoisie Cervantes. Of so. But do you think it's over? <laughs> no, honestly, I mean the question. Look, look again. The question vis a vis Adorno. I hope yeah. so. Yeah. You think it is? I think it is. Yeah, with the bourgeoisie. Yeah. It's over. Really, yeah. 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 Look. There's a, it's a bourgeois form, it's not a proletarian form. There's, yeah. there's an essay, mm -hmm. his name is Feher, F-E-H-E-R. -E is the novel possible? It's a, it, it appeared in Telos in 1831. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he <laughs> wished he lived that long. He, but he, he was a man of the 19th century, right. no and question then, about the, it. And, and this essay, Argues, probably not. It's yeah, not possible. Yeah, not possible. Because the conditions that produced the novel, namely the high moment of bourgeois uh, right. culture and uh, capitalism, is gone. In other words, the social totality no longer, you know, allows. <laughs> well, for such a exactly. Form. I mean. Yeah. But look, I read this on that one. I mean, the summer. Paradise Papers read better than most novels. I read that in the Café of Lost Youth, <laughs> yeah. this summer about Guy Debord and all of his followers in Paris. And it's like one of the most lovely novels I've ever read. And I'm reading Paradise Alley, I mean, in, in Absalom, Absalom right now. And it's like to say that the well, novel doesn't Absalom, exist. Absalom, well, you know, I mean, yeah. 1930s. Yeah. But I mean, but the Café of Lost Youth is the 1970s that yeah. they wrote that. And that's like, I mean, I, that's the most recent novel. That I've, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know. I still think it's. I don't have to agree. The academic arguments against it. People still have to tell their stories. You know, I think the narrative form still is something that people gravitate towards. I think it, whether it's a memoir or a novel, it's still. Well, that I mean, essentially was Leotard's position in terms of the postmodern condition that the small narrative form is all that we have left. That forget the totality. Forget to, you know. We're not, we're not, put, we're not putting anybody down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I think not. It, it was not as a novelist. It was. It was not uh, anybody but Faulkner who ended the novel. The yeah. Absalom, Absalom is one of the last real novels that is that you can trace back to Dostoevsky. 
Mario Vargas Llosa is still writing his variations on that. Who? Mario Vargas Llosa, who's still well, alive. So is Garcia still, Marquez. Yeah, yeah. What is 100 Years of Solitude? It's a variation on It's not on a it. variation on Faulkner's. And that's a pretty good know, novel. Tom, Tom, that's Tom, a pretty good novel. Can, yeah, Tom, it's Tom, it's Tom, pretty, yeah. can you imagine, no, seriously, yeah. can you imagine another Dostoevsky now? I mean, with that range? I think that Marquez, who just died a few years ago, is absolutely on that Short level. stories. Borges' is short stories. Borges' is short stories are fantastic, too. I mean, I, don't, I can... I don't Borges' have to agree short stories are very good. Yeah. But the short stories of Marquez are wonderful. Oh, yeah. Nobody writes the Colonel. It's just, <laughs> just a wonderful... Yeah. Borges' my favorite, too. Oh, yeah. Compilation yeah. of uh, I'm short stories. That yeah, that's a great one. Yeah. His I Melancholy Horse, his last Tony novel about yeah. Melancholy Horse, fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who? His last novel, his story about Mel Melancholy Horse. I mean, yeah. incredible. So I'm going to stop arguing and just... <laughs> no, no, it's, it's good, though. You know. I mean, it shows, it's based on, you know, yeah. the discussion today, really, in a way. Yeah. Because the question is, is this dialectic of the novel exhausted itself and hit yeah. the point of where it no longer has a, a, a move? Right. You know, and then the, I think a larger question is, does art itself in any of its genres, painting, sculpture, music, yeah. the novel, poetry, etc., have any po possibilities now, today, yeah. except to recycle the old forms. Yeah. This is another, I mean, a real story here, I mean, going yeah. forward, because we had these moments in the 20s, maybe again, you know, somewhat after that. In the 30s. In the 30s, yeah. where the experiments I, I were there, say, but are I we exceeding this? I wouldn't, yes, say yeah. that, I wouldn't say that James T. Farrell is, is, is a novelist of the quality of uh, William Faulkner. But the themes that he hit on, not mainly Studs Lonergan, although Studs Lonergan as well, but the Daniel Neal series, which is The World I Never Made, about a young man who simply faces the structures of, of hegemony and tries to buck them, is a really powerful novel and did very well by the right. box office. We don't have that kind of stuff going on anymore. Yeah, I much. Mean, I, I just read a review of actually of this, you know, uh, the Vietnam War thing that uh, uh, Ken, Ken Burns, Ken Burns yeah. did. Yeah. Um, and he writes the the reviewer writes more about sort of he compares it. Well, first of all, he says it's not a documentary. It's 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 television. You know, it's yeah. a. Right. And, and you know because people you mean Ken Burns? Yeah, he didn't like it. Oh, Did you like it? Did you watch shit. it? No? I, want, I haven't watched. <laughs> I haven't watched it all. You're being um, nice, man. I've watched. Oh, some. You're I've being watched nice. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've watched some. I do it. But I mean, but he talks about it in terms of its relationship to bourgeois society. Yeah, sure. You know, and uh, and brings in sort of like okay, Moby Dick. You know, Melville's Moby Dick is of that era kind of the epitome of, uh, yeah. uh, you know, because, and, and Melville never was successful, you know, in his, in his own time. Um, whereas... Well, individual, individual works of fiction did very, very well. Yeah. He, he died he in poverty. He wrote for magazines, he died in poverty, though, but he made a living by writing for magazines. I think it was a ser for serials for uh, magazines. Well, he was right, he was working down on Wall Street, too, as a customs, 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 yeah. yeah. Customs house, yeah. yeah. But I mean, and then he compared him to Mark Twain, who he said was a very tough novelist, but he actually, like if you look at Huckleberry Finn, it, he started off, you know, writing a, writing a true novel, but then he, you know, stopped and let it sit for 10 years until he could develop the, the, the uh, publishing house and all of this stuff to actually make make it a successful publication yeah. uh, and and then he he did he sent Jim and Huck down the river incredible which yeah but but he said anybody you know Jim would never have gone down the river <laughs> going down the river was not the way to go <laughs> up the river <laughs> Sweet home Chicago. Uh, yeah. Sweet home yeah. Chicago. Yeah, <laughs> up the river or up the yeah. Ohio or something like right. that. But right. but right. Twain didn't know up the river. He right. worked down Life the river. Life on the Mississippi. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. what a great novel, though. Well, yeah, what except he, he also said that it's it's like 
it's it has kind of a nutty ending, you know. Because Jim was free. He said Jim was free the whole time. We well, Jim that. was a free man, you know, in the beginning of the novel. Oh, yeah. But in the end, you know, he's living in a chicken coop and is kind of a step and fetch it. Mm -hmm. And you know, and, and he thought it. He thought that this was because he wanted success. Twain wanted success, you know. Well, and well, when I taught at Irvine. A student, graduate student, came to me and said, I'd like you to be my mentor in an independent study for a single novel. And I said, that's very interesting, what is it? And she said, it's our mutual friend by Dickens. I said, I know the novel, I haven't read it. So I read it with her. Right. I don't think there's a novel today that could shine the shoes of that book. Um, it's not the only one of his books. There, there's others of that period that um, are really also extremely good. And you can't, and not only good, but I mean, they do, in Lukács' terms, in his theory of the novel, exemplify an error, you know? Yeah, yeah. We put Lucari in that category, though. Lucari is one of the people who writing <coughs> in a hackney ja genre writes beautiful literature? I agree with that. He's in that. Uh, he's in that. Um, in that place. He's really what good. He's been very good. As a provocation, what about the David Foster Wallace, like Infinite Jest? I don't know her. I'm sorry. I haven't read him. What do you think? It is a short story. It, is, it does sort of have this short yeah. temporal. But yeah. It's fast in its sort of. I mean, it is a postmodern novel. In the sense oh, yeah. that it's all over the fucking map. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's faster. It's, in a certain way, it's a certain, it's a, there's a certain heaviness to it. Yeah. Right? In terms of its engagement. Is it a thousand the pages? Yeah. Yeah, and 300 small. pages of footnotes. Read it yeah. Yeah. all? Not all, yeah. most of it. I'm still hard, to, it's hard to get through it. It's but. 300 it pages of footnotes and parallel wow. narratives, different temporals, kind of movements. Yeah. It's um, hard. It's very hard. Yeah. It, but it feels like it's, it captures the moment. You know, it's sort of like, yeah. Ten years ahead of the the present, in a sense, but right. I don't know. It's an interesting question. I mean, Kurt Vonnegut, Slaughterhouse Five. I just reread that. That's just a, just a lovely, you know. I mean, sure. Yeah, you but, know, it's such a telling, and that's like a memoir sort of thing. But it's yeah. still just. <sighs> Maybe we shouldn't call it a novel, like Infinite Jest. Maybe it deserves a different name. You know, Whatever that is, yeah, that's Kurt, a good Kurt, Kurt Vonnegut was the most disconsolate person I've ever known. Yeah. I mean that seriously. He he growled and and uh, put down everything. I mean, in, in, in conversation that ever existed, that ever crossed his path. But Billy Pilgrim is a memorable figure in the novel. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I think he's a good, a very fine novelist. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a kind of a it's a kind of a genre. That he put down. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that came where, out that's, of the, the devastation of World War II. Yeah. People are still working that out. Yeah. We're still all working that little of that. You know? That whole period, the early 20th century. Yeah. But I think that Vonnegut is still writing a 19th century novel. Yeah. Do you guys ever read Mario Vargas Llosa? No, I haven't read no. it. He's like, yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, that guy, he's sure. still alive. He still says Boris is the only one of all the magic realists anybody will read, but he's still... Peruvian. Right? Yeah. 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 It's terrible yeah. politics. Yeah, yeah awful that's why politics. I'm, he's, 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 he's a total good reason. He's a total I mean, he signed the... That's why he got in his fight with Marquez, because he signed, he signed the critique of Castro, and Marquez wouldn't sign it. And uh, they got in a fight about... Or they also it's, got in a fight about women. You can't really you know. say much about it. But he's not... But, I yeah, I remember. I remember. I remember it when uh, uh, Eduardo Galliano was speaking up here. Yeah. And uh, they kept this guy kept asking him the guy who was uh, his yeah. publisher kept asking him. So can you compare your work to um, Vargas Llosa? And 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 Galliano just looks at him and goes. Vargas Llosa is a fascist. I have nothing in common with him. <laughs> but his novels are beautiful. No, I know. I mean, his novels are. I mean, I'm Julie the scriptwriter. I don't know. I think it's one of the best novels last. <laughs> no, I know. But I, I mean, mean, you know. But he kept on bringing it up, and finally, 
you know, finally Galliano reaches over and grabs the stack of question cards from him and starts reading through them and goes, oh, this is an interesting question. He, yeah. just, he just kicks the guy off the stage, basically. You know? That's a good example. The Latin American boom mm -hmm. of the 19, late 70s to 1990 was a boom that was adopted largely, with some exceptions, one of them being Gabriel uh, uh, um, Garcia and Marcus, by very few. It was a, it was a 15-year boom. Fantastic, right? And it's gone. Yeah, magic realism. Yeah. As, as a genre. Yeah. 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 Late 60s. And then the literary people in literary theory had Bakhtin, yeah. and everybody had to read Bakhtin, Dostoevsky's poetry, uh, poetics. Yeah, you, you, you had to read um, dialogical imagination. Dialogic imagination. Rabelais and his world. Yeah, and Rabelais and his world. You had to read <laughs> a mythology, and that's gone. Yeah. Right. Right. The literary field is not is not fecund in relation to new ideas. It really is it. I mean, the literary critical field. Oh, literary criticism. Well, yeah. Well, that's how a lot of philosophy first came into U.S. universities through de literature departments yeah. and criticism. Sure, but that's not, that's not enough. If yeah. it becomes part of a discipline, it's not enough. I think, I think, you know, in San Francisco, when I was, you know, doing AIDS activism and still doing AIDS activism, but, you know, writers like Dorothy Allison, Bastard Out of Carolina, I mean, so, I mean, the Stone Witch Blues, and I think Leslie Feinberg's sort of memoir, trans memoir, people are trying to tell new kinds of stories, and I don't think it's a dead... You know, I think people still have different subjectivities I and novels are ways I've of... I've taught that novel, right. but I, I think it, still think it's a 19th century novel. It's a 19th century novel I mean, with different new kinds of... up and it's so sad and she... You know, it's like the death of little Nell and Dickens. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... I mean, you're talking about... I mean, in dialectical, you're talking about um, new content but not a new form. That's because Chris that's keeps that's saying, you right. know, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, this is part of a very interesting part of the discussion here. Right. You know, are, are we able to produce new forms, or has, as Benjamin Brecht and others suggested, we have reached the limits? You and know, even like the Greek, the Greek way, tragedies, and Greek, the we told the same yeah, story yeah, over yeah. and over. Has What's wrong with that? Yeah, yeah. Like go, go beyond. Yeah. Right at this point. So yeah. it's yeah. the subject yeah. 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 The subject, okay, because if we're going to retell the same Greek story, same tragedies over and over, which is fine, then what do we have to do to be dialectical then? Is it being more subjectivity, subjective about the materialist it's conditions? It's not subjective of, about, it's about subjectivity. Yeah. It's different. Okay. Yeah. Subject, subjectivity is a widespread social phenomenon, which is how people collectively look at the world, yeah. and how that gets transmitted. Um, here's an example of, of, of the problem. My daughter went to Wesleyan. In her junior year, she had to read the Brothers Karamazov. Right. She has that good friend who dropped out of Oberlin for love interest in all sorts of things and then re-entered college to Hunter as an English major in her junior year and never read the Brothers Karamazov and never read a major work by Dickens. That's a problem in Hunter. What'd you say? It says very bad things about Hunter College. <laughs> oh, it's true. It's become a part of the technical apparatus of which uh, we all are aware. The students rebel against that. They don't want to read the classics, and um, the departments don't don't push it. They they it's they identity teach politics. Teach you read teach minor literature. Easy I mean, stuff. Literature. Teach what they can relate to, but as if you couldn't relate to Dostoevsky. 
Did people like reading it? Did she like it? It was in. Did she? It passed. Read it? By, uh, she read it, but it didn't. It didn't register. Really? No. Uh, it vastly. That was the most popular class. Russian what? novel. Russian novel was absolutely the most popular class. You're, you're a little older than she is. <sighs> <laughs> Just a little. Just a little. It's bro. okay. <laughs> you and me, Beth. Yeah, you and me, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. They'll still listen to you in San Francisco. <laughs> no, don't worry. To continue to say what, what Michael was saying about the, um, or astounding, this, reflecting the totality of the epic, apparently when Dostoevsky died, um, Everybody showed up to the funeral. The anarchists, the aristocrats, right. the, you know, the terrorists. They were all you know, purged. The, the secret yeah. police. Well, there was a terrorist in the beginning, you yeah. know, himself. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Weren't they all purged? T t t no, but everybody showed up, including the cla all classes. All classes all showed up. Okay. The Lumpen proletariat had read it. Every, I mean, those who could read. Yeah. yeah. So everybody showed up to Dostoevsky's. Uh, yeah. So well, it was like an epic best. defining figure in Russian art. Yeah. 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 Hi. I know we're on literary matters, but Stanley, where do you place electronic music, especially as taught in the academy? I mean, yeah. it's, it's literally they're all the rage. Composers who don't at least compose, you know, electroacoustic music are not considered, are all, you know, are lumped in those just working in the past. And yet, you know, for me, electronic music is, is where music is just totally dissolved into the abstract, right? Um, although there are operas accompanied by electronic scores, um, wordless He said the same thing in Cage's heyday. No, that, that was a comment to say that it's a struggle for me. For you? I, and, 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 and I think it's a struggle all around because there's a lot of acoustic music being composed and being performed which has extremely modernist um, Feeling and, and, and harmonies, um, but but the electronic moment has still not yet been achieved. I don't think people are composing and people are, are performing. I think there's also an interesting question here that I was thinking about also about this kind of technique music is that we're still stuck to in academia, especially academic music is the but also commercial music. It's new tools but old forms, right? It's sort of like. If you listen to popular music, they use plugins to correct voices or whatever to come up with new sounds, but the form is still the popular song. It's still the three minute kind of simplistic um, you know, music. So it, with the electronics, they haven't really brought anything new except make music production cheaper and yes. more profitable. Well, but Frank, but Frank the, Zappin's done stuff. No, no, but yeah. then the, the real art, yeah. the real sort of creative forces, yeah. you know, in any style of music, they've used the new technology to invent new forms, but those are rare examples. The, sim the, symphon the symphony has been challenged in so-called classical music, or, or sometimes called serious music. The symphony as a form has been challenged. It's been exhausted. Since, Very no, since form, right. Ravel, yeah. Debussy, who your daughter, both of whom your daughter hated their work, but, that, but the symphony as a form has been challenged. <laughs> and uh, it, it continues to rise up with all four movements or five movements or two movements, but it's still there. It's see, funny. the you one thing see. that I find interesting I'm not, uh, is that here you have an acoustic composer who died in 1975, his name is Dmitry Shostakovich, who wrote um, acoustic music in a, in a tonal, uh, in a tonal um, uh, mode, and that music is pretty goddamn difficult to absorb into um, Tchaikovsky or, you know, or Debussy or Ravel or yeah. anybody like and that. And followed by uh, Stockhausen. By Stockhausen Carl was totally, he was a hoe. Yeah, okay. You don't agree, or you no? Don't I don't know. I mean, I don't but know it well enough to know, know it, if he was derivative that way. He yeah, was very know. derivative. Yeah, yeah. But I think there's another question about music here, like the difference between European um, composed music, like pre-composed music, like just the Chicago Symphony, or um, and sort of American like improvised music, right, on the same level of complexity. So, I think. If, in my opinion, like I think the sort of post-capitalist moment, the transitionary moment would be uh, improvised music, which of course is dialectical. That's dialectical 
yeah. attention because early 18th century, or up to early 19th century European music was also improvised. I mean, Beethoven symphonies were, <coughs> Beethoven, a Beethoven piano concerto was essentially, what was written out was the, the solo piano part, mostly. All, all five? <coughs> Piano concertos? Um, at least the early ones, right? In other words, they at were... At least the early ones. I would seriously contest, although I would love to see it I might myself proven otherwise, because I am a fan of improvised music, that the third, fourth, and fifth symphonies uh, of, uh, of piano concertos of Beethoven were improvised. I think it ends with Beethoven. I think, I think, I think, I think with That's Beethoven you have the high yeah. end of that. Yeah. But I think if you go earlier, like if you go to <coughs> Viennese school, like Mozart, yeah. Haydn, I think the orchestra, the bass line was improvised. There was, you know, figured bass. So I think there's an interesting tension in American music that improvised music is really sort of the strength of American music, whether jazz. it's jazz or yeah. whether it's punk rock or or it's the, the experimental I, forms of those yeah. musics, right? And World I think music. that's the tension between European-based yeah. symphonic pre-composed music. And I think that's the music of bourgeois, the height of bourgeois culture, right? The great symphonies of like Bruckner and Beethoven. And I mean, Beethoven was the revolutionary bourgeois sort of era, right? The French Revolution. And, um, so I think that that period has exhausted itself. So it's kind of silly to write symph symphonies today, in my opinion, because that form has been exhausted. It's kind of maybe like the novel, right? Um, I mean, Messiaen wrote symphonies, the Turanga Lila, you know, two hours, you know, but bird songs, and, and that's exhausted. You know? But Goreski's Symphony of Sorrowful Souls. I but mean, that's old, that's 19th century aesthetic. Yeah, yeah, but it's a brand new symphony, though. And but it's, it's the same story. It's old forms with new sounds, new right? Sounds. Whereas, whereas yeah. late Coltrane improvisation or Mingus big band 24 minute composition. I, look, I love improvisational music. And I saw, I saw Don Cherry play with hip hop musicians in San Francisco. Or that kind it was of stuff incredible like, to hear those that overlap. I agree think, with you. But I think know, those music, that's where the interesting question is music. what is music today that's yeah. not falling in the trap of the old? Forms and or, or the or the new sounds and the old forms, which is a lot of hip hop too. You know, but when they, when you, when Fronis Quartet plays Jimi Hendrix, you know, it may be an old quartet, but it does not sound like the quartet I we're listening Jimi to. Hendrix. I understand what you're saying. Well, it's crazy <laughs> reliable sound. It's it's great. Great. Yeah. The music is recreated in the live repetition of it. Yeah. Right? Every right. time it's played, right. but. That still doesn't address Michael's issue. The challenge but is the yeah. new forms. What yeah, are the new forms in art? Yeah, it's always the new yeah. forms. Yeah. Yeah. Even electronica, yeah. and I, I think, think it's more of the, well, you can, much of it is, for me, po just potpourri or collage. It doesn't really hit on a form. I mean, some of it is structured. Yeah. There's a guy working out of Boston Conservatory who's developed an ear training program for listening to electronic music. Uh, El Eldari, I think he's... Uh, from Israel, I, I, I was reading a paper, his dissertation, which is, is online. I'll get his name next week. It's very interesting. You know, we have the traditional ear training, da, 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 you know, major triad that, that we learn for, for acoustic music. He's developing these uh, ear training, I don't know, kind of pedagogy. The interesting thing is we did, we learning how to listen to electronic music. Yeah. We probably don't really know how to listen to Mingus yet. I think that's the challenge. That a lot that right. I mean, we have to listen to those the high points of American. Like, <laughs> that's the best music. I love me. Well, I mean, well, I mean, right. So in other words, in the conservative that's communism to me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he was a bit of a crankpot too. Yeah, well, I don't I mean, mean him as an ideologue. I mean, I'm talking about the music itself. <laughs> well, I'm here. Yeah. 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 I gotta pick my kids up. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah. Can I get a shot, Stanley? Is that okay? Sure, get a shot. These, yeah. but, but, but Mingus <laughs> and company and culture and so on. Thank you guys. These were serious <laughs> students yeah. of the history of music. They were yes. not. Uh, simply jazz musicians. Oh, it's here. Oh, I thought you said five minutes. Oh, it's here. I okay. think Coltrane. Where's the same? My here. Yeah. 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 Uh, you want me to um, oh, no. go down and hold it? Yes, please. I'm going to leave. I'll run down.